<laughs> All right, I think we're, um, I'm gonna give it 30 seconds and then we will get started. Um, and while folks are still trickling in, um, if you wish, you can also adjust your um, screen ID name, uh, indicating your name, uh, where you are joining us from, and your uh, organizational affiliation, if you wish. That's a really cool feature, Giselle. Being able to change your name for these things. All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're dialing from. Thank you so much for joining this session. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to uh, remind uh, everyone that this is a public event and the conversation today will be on the record. Uh, there may also be journalists in the room with us. Uh, as Sapna mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, attendees can go uh, and move across breakout sessions and we encourage that because the whole purpose is for you all to access as much relevant information as possible. Now, if you had joined us during the opening fireside chat with Darren Walker, president of Ford Foundation, he made a very compelling case that we can all benefit when we factor inclusion, when we factor diversity in our economic system. So it is most appropriate that this breakout session that you're in uh, it focuses on building a more diverse and inclusive economy. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Giselle Long. I'm a managing director at the gym. And as a moderator today, I'll be kicking off by inviting our speakers to share concrete, innovative examples of how they're practicing the next normal in the here and now. I'll also be fielding questions from the audience. I'm joined by two colleagues from the gym. Haley Olofsky, our tech lead, and Rachel Bass, our questions lead. I'll tell you more in just a second on how they will help us run the session uh, smoothly. In terms of format, uh, we'll dedicate the first half uh, to remarks by our speakers and the second half to Q&A. Now, before we get started, um, I wanna cover a few technical uh, details uh, in this Zoom uh, breakout room. All of you are joining muted and in video only mode. While you won't be able to speak with each other, you will be able to chat using the chat box that's in the bottom left of your screen. Now a quick refresher. When you go into the chat box, you see a little scroll tab. The default setting should be everyone, which means your chat message will go to everyone in this room. So uh, go to everyone if you wanna introduce yourself, share general comments and any relevant resources as we um, chat through the session. We'll also be collecting questions for the three speakers for the Q&A portion using the chat box. Now these questions must be submitted to questions lead and not to everyone, not to me, not to the speakers. To do that, when you're ready to submit a question, go to chat box, click on the little scroll tab, select questions lead, and then place your question there. Rachel, our questions lead, perhaps you can say hi in the chat box so folks know where you are, how to find you. And I will only be able to look at questions sent to the questions lead. Of course, you can send your questions anytime throughout the conversation and not only during the Q&A portion. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties, you can also select tech lead in the chat box uh, and Haley will be able to troubleshoot for you. All right, now that we got the logistical details out of the way, let's go to today's conversation. The idea that business and finance doesn't serve 
the interest of all people isn't new. Uh, but this past year with the global pandemic, uh, racial justice movements, economic disruptions, and climate-related disasters only make this, uh, put this notion into sharper focus. It's clear that we need to move beyond status quo. And today we have three leaders uh, from the impact investing community who are paving the way to build an economy that is more inclusive and more diverse. Uh, we have assembled a panel that is diverse on a number of dimensions, uh, geography, race, ethnicity, as well as the different perspectives that they bring to this conversation and the different roles that our speakers organizations are playing in advancing the topic of today's discussion. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Monica Brand Engel uh, is a longtime investor and entrepreneur who is a co-founding partner of Quona, a venture firm that focuses on fintech inclusion, uh, for inclusion in emerging markets. Rajni Bandesha from LeapFrog Investment um, is senior manager of Impact Lab. LeapFrog is a growth private equity investor in Africa and Asia that focuses on financial services and healthcare businesses that address the opportunity to serve 4 billion emerging consumer. And in her role at LeapFrog, Roshni oversees social impact assessment initiatives. Last but not least, Crystal Cornelius. Crystal is, a Rachel and C, uh, is the president and CEO of Ovista Corporation, a, a national uh, native community development finance institution intermediary that predominantly serves native communities across the United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. Welcome to you all. So just to get the conversation going, uh, given that today's topic is building for a more diverse and inclusive economy, I'd like to know from the speakers, what does this topic mean for your organization and what's the entry point that you come in? Um, I'd like to uh, invite Monica to start and then Roshni and Crystal. Um, Monica, turn it over to you. Thanks, Giselle. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, I hope this is, can be a conversation as we are learning as much as uh, uh, sharing. So Quona is a venture firm focused on fintech for inclusion in emerging markets, and that phrase is how we define ourselves, so clearly it's part of our DNA to think about inclusion at every level of our work. Of course, that includes starts with the end customer and the target market we're trying to provide high-quality, affordable, accessible financial services to. Um, but it also includes the way we do that in terms of who we seek out as portfolio companies and even how we build our own business. So it's been a point of pride of Quona that the team itself is diverse, that we are the three founding co-founders. Um, one's a woman, one's a person of color, um, and one's a white guy. I actually think they have to be part of the solution too. So uh, we are um, very, and we're very much, I would say, uh, take an approach uh, that moves away from blaming and shaming and just gets curious and really trying to understand why has it been so lopsided? What are some of the implicit biases, the uh, misunderstandings and misinformation that cause um, sort of a very homogeneous um, uh, structure to, to continue to exist? Uh, and uh, this year in particular, uh, you know, and I'll be very honest, I've never defined myself or used the moniker of even uh, gender lens as in terms of female um, or any other kind of inclusion because we were uniquely focused on financial inclusion and understanding why our financial service is lopsided. That said, I've really both a personal journey of my own as well as some of the movements and what's happened in the world in the last you know, um, 24 to 36 months have really said that we have, that's not enough. And so we've taken an explicit um, uh, pursuit this year and last, uh, starting last year actually, to really dive deep and understand how can we put inclusion more specifically on the agenda, starting with Kona and making our own team more diverse, looking at our portfolio companies, which also are not diverse, and then of course the end clients, which are why we get up in the morning. Great, thank you, Monica. Roshni, can you share with us uh, what your entry point is to this conversation? Absolutely. So for LeapFrog Investments, we've, we've been around for about 12 years now and 
the core focus of our mantra or mandate is at the end of the day, the emerging consumer, the customers that we're trying to serve. To me personally, they are the most important shareholders or stakeholders of LeapFrog in some way, even more than sometimes investors, because at the end of the day, it's the end consumers for whom the reason for which LeapFrog even began. And then that's what has actually helped us work with really interesting high growth companies within Africa and Asia. When we think about the inclusive economy and the way that Monica is talking about it has grown, inclusion has or exclusion has changed. Earlier, you could see exclusion in the basis of just income, then it's again gender, race, et cetera. And now it's becoming more and more clearer that exclusion is multifaceted. So inclusion also needs to be something in which we are able to really understand what is the specific piece that we want to work on. So where inclusion starts for us is really thinking about giving the end consumer who we are trying to serve the ability to talk about their wants, their needs, and their aspirations. I think often what we have seen in the past is you have an idea of a product that perhaps a consumer need, but what you really want is to give people the aspirational products that helps them move from their household, which is at one point to the next point. And that also, when it is more aspirational driven, it gives them ability and, and a feeling of more ownership towards their own growth. So that's one of the things that we've really tried to both inculcate within LeapFrog, but also our portfolio companies, that how do you listen to them, not just from your own lens of what you think they need or want, but what is their aspiration from financial and healthcare inclusion? And how can you become better listeners at the end of the day? And we've seen companies who've immediately jumped onto this bandwagon and then other companies who've learned as they've built certain skill sets over the years. So that for me will constantly remain, I think, the end point, because if, we, if they are our biggest shareholder or stakeholder, the end consumers, we need to be listening to them continuously in order to evolve both how we invest, but also how we grow. Great. Thank you, Roshni. Crystal, same question. Yes, so looking at inclusion just overall in our entry point, um, I'll start with a, a brief introduction of our organization. Again, my name is Crystal Cornelius. I'm president and CEO of OISTA. I'm a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa and the United Nation of Wisconsin. So OISTA is the longest standing intermediary lender in the nation, specifically serving native communities, Alaska and Hawaii. And when I think on our terms, we're a native run and led organization. Um, the entry points we specifically look at really is quite broad and quite blatant. And it's, you know, a lack of investment in capital and credit in native communities since colonization began. So we were really um, formulated to be a capital arm for Indian country. There's been congressional studies, um, essentially, why do we have millions of dollars going into, you know, sovereign nations? We have 574 recognized tribes, federally recognized tribes within the United States. We have over 300 state recognized tribes and we have over 100 communities that don't have recognition, but are Aboriginal and um, Indigenous people still staying on their land. So in looking at how we really integrate capital in these communities, a majority of our communities and our reservations um, are in very remote and rural areas. Um, I wouldn't say all, but in looking at how we've been able to build our own economic development bases, private sector, um, and consumer-driven lending, which is fair and not predatory, because one thing to note, we really have had to fight against the predatory lending institutions um, for years and years, because typically that was the only source of credit that our communities had. That was our interjection into the capital system, other than looking at banks are saying, no, I don't have the assets, I don't have the collateral, to whether that's looking at being an entrepreneur or a homeowner. So OISTA really has um, grown in, in regards to, you know, three specific measures. I think when we look at tangible um, measures in which we, we are inclusive in our communities, you know, we've got practice strategies and approaches. Our practices really are building up community development and create our, creating our own market. In 1999, there were two certified CDFIs, native. Now we have over 69. OISTA has really helped build these financial institutions, build the capacity of tribal members throughout the United States to become um, lenders 
or borrowers to these institutions. And we have changed the economic landscape like we've never been seen before in Indian country. And it, it hasn't been that hard in some measures. It's just getting the word out. We've got a lot of narratives that we have to push against. Indian country is a risky bet. What is sovereignty? We've revolved over 77 million in Indian country with one loan default in 20 years. So a lot of this is addressing invisibility, especially when we're looking at a, a larger measure of where America is in its growing stages, albeit all of these racial conversations are really important, but we're still not at the table. So this is something that um, we perpetually work on, really proud of, but inclusion really is in our DNA. I believe to, to really open up those markets, create those markets and allow tribal members and native communities to enjoy the rest of the financial products um, that America enjoys on a mainstream level. So that's what we do. Great, thank you, Crystal. Um, one thing that I'm uh, an objective for, for these conversations is to really bring out very tangible examples of how you all work with the stakeholders and the communities um, and around the issues that you uh, highlighted. Um, and um, I would also want to encourage our audience uh, to listen closely. Uh, feel free to start posing your questions to questions lead in the chat box um, as we go, um, as we move on. Monica, you talk about the starting the journey of bringing uh, an inquiry, a uh, curiosity around inclusion at Quona and also um, equally importantly uh, at your portfolio companies. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about specifically how you tackle that uh, and how are you or how have you been working with your portfolio companies um, on this topic? Yeah, so um, I'm a big believer. Personal, I'll just kind of talk about it personally, and, and, and you know, as a leader, how I think about this. So I'm a big believer in um, what I call nonviolent communication, which uh, starts as a premise that um, uh, one that uh, actually I assume positive intent. So I, I start with the premise that it is not a conspiracy to keep women down and exclude people. I, there are people like that. I think there are those who can't minimize that. But I think most of the problems that happen and the exclusion that happens is accidental um, or, or blind spots is what, how I describe it. And so that's where the inquiry comes. That's where I get curious and say, okay, how do I look at this as, you know, so for me, the, you know, one of my quotes is I went to Stanford Business School. And if you had Stanford Business School graduates that were 95% or 90, uh, I think it's 93% white male and 7%, you know, people of color and women, you're like, wow, that's weird. That can't be the best solution. That can't be being, I guess it's bizarre. Like everyone would think that was just weird and that you would want to like fix that. That's a problem, right? That you can't think that you're bringing your best talent, your best ideas, your best resources forward if that's what the pool looks like. So what we've done is, to, and that, I really say that a lot because I think some of the reasons why defensives happen is the idea of um, people who are admittedly frustrated of having to wait so long and having not been heard um, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, sort of approach it with an urgency that um, is required and necessary, but I think um, meeting people where they're at is part of why I think we was one of the very key tenants, both internally, um, as well as with our companies. So we start, so I agree with Roshni that it's all about the end clients, but I, we, we don't think you can fix the end client problem until you fix the problem starting with us. And we're not where we want to be as Quona, I'll say that right there, um, as well as our companies. And so we go and so we've been in this process of asking them saying, hey, well, number one, how do you define diversity? So what does is, what is, um, you know, structural racism mean in Mexico versus India versus Indonesia? And even, and what's, what's fascinating, and we have a, a one pager that we're happy to share on this. Um, but one thing we've learned is that race means something very, very different in each of the countries where we work. So, um, and it's, it's complex, um, you know, I would say in, in India, for example, the way um, marginalization happens is not so cleanly on racial lines. It happens in other ways. I mean, there's the caste, there's geography, there's other ways, but it is, um, it is uh, very, very complex. So, so literally it's not black and white. And so that creates, and even look at South Africa. So in South Africa, which is a country where I've lived multiple times with my family, you know, the you know, black, white, colored, you know, it's the Indian population. There's a lot of, um, again, that also brings in nuance. And again, who is the marginalized, who's the oppressor? There's a lot of discussion around that. So one is even just getting a language that we feel we can get comfortable with. One thing that's been super interesting for me personally is that gender 
has been easy. <laughs> it's been much easier. Although again, with gender identity and gender identification, I don't want to minimize and wash over that. But amazingly, our companies are talking about not just um, gender identity, but sexual orientation. And so that also is not so simple, but it's a little easier actually than race. And so what we found is by starting a dialogue where we begin talking about how do they define these problems? What are some of the ways they're even teasing out the issues, right? Because most people don't even realize there's a problem. Like, oh, well, there's just not a lot of women engineers or there's not a lot of people of color who are engineers. So they'll sort of talk, blame it on the education system and kind of absolve themselves like, hmm, is that really true? One, is it really true? Is it true that there aren't women engineers? Is it true that they're not people who are qualified that look differently today? And so even just beginning to bring up this topic by actually asking the folks that are there who are underrepresented, but at least present to even start sharing their reality and just sharing how small things, and that's the other thing really important to point out, it's micro things, right? Like, you know, do you have bathrooms that are equally easily located? What does your rec room look like? What's in your fridge? Right, like, I mean, again, that actually, it's very much, you realize, hmm, what messages are you sending when it's just, you know, sports, and not that women don't like sports, right? But that if, you know, just, there's a lot that gets sent um, when just on even designing a rooms, what you have available. And again, it's not about um, accommodating every need, but even making people aware that, here's another example. We had a company in Colombia who it's equivalent, I mean, I don't wanna speak in Spanish, but it'd be like the way gay, like the way, you know, when kids, when I go like with, you would say gay as if like, oh, that's, um, you know, that's a weird thing to do, right? It was like kind of a shorthand and realized, well, actually that today might not be the best choice of word, right? Like just to even, um, you know, sort of small decisions that are made um, that just communicate respect and caring starting there. Now, again, that is not gonna change that I have 96% of my engineers are men, right? So that's, you know, this, but again, back to you, important to establish a playing field, important to bring awareness, important to understand how you can do things differently. Then, so then you begin talking about, okay, well, how do you recruit? Where do you recruit? How long do you leave positions open to make sure that the candidate base is diverse? You know, as you start asking questions, have you looked at pay scales? Have you looked at, have you broken down your pay scales and see how much are women paid versus men or how much people of color are paid versus you know, people uh, um, of privilege? You know, so you, you begin um, building a, a data set and awareness that, from a, that becomes the point, um, the departure point of actually thinking about, okay, how do we address this? But I think people jump to, let's do a training, let's, you know, let's get a really to the, how do we address this without really putting the problem statement clearly in a way that's embraced. So mm -hmm. that has, has been our approach. And um, again, it, it means it's longer. So that process is longer, results are slower, but we are about the long game and about building sustainable results, not just checking a box saying, okay, great. I did the diversity thing. I did the girl thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monica. Roshni, you, you talked about inculcating a, a practice of inclusion at LeapFrog as well as in your portfolio companies. Um, can you speak more to that? You know, how are you working with portfolio companies um, to meet the needs uh, of the end consumers? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll start with what Crystal had said, uh, bringing people to the table. I think that's, that's a very key term because what we are at the end of the day trying to do is bring the voice of the consumer to the table where decisions are being made. So one of the things that we've noticed across portfolio companies is, uh, you know, there's generally an idea about this product is going to really work for the consumer. And it's, it's going to lead to financial inclusion. So the example that I'll talk about is one of our investments, which is in Ghana, My Life Insurance they already had an insurance product that they were selling a traditional one. And the idea was that this needs to be brought further downstream into the lower income consumer subsegment. And they tried it, but it just did not pick up. And the biggest problem that they were facing is that, well, probably it's not financially sustainable. And that's where we thought like, let's flip the script a lot. Like let's actually think about how you listen to the consumers that you're trying to target. Because at the end of the day, a funeral insurance product is, is something that, is very critical to a number of households, right? Funeral is often a way to honor the people who have left the family. So you really have to build in that aspiration part into it as well. So we, we thought about three things that we did to portfolio company. The first is really understanding who is it that you're speaking to, not only the consumers, but also the non-customers and the communities. 
It's from the communities that you often get a lot of interesting insights about what is the value of this financial inclusion and how can you provide that value through your product, right? Because then that way you can move forward towards it. Um, the second thing that we did with them is to make sure that we did not only chase for perfection, that unless it's a thousand people that you've spoken to, um, you know, your, your, your insights are invalid. We said, let's start small. Let's start by talking to 20, 25 people, but really listening to them and understanding what and how would they like to use this funeral insurance. And over there, we figured out that savings is a huge part of it and understanding and unlocking savings could be something that is critical for them as part of the product. And the third is that we, we thought about, let's look at what's really working around us, which is this human-centered design concept, which really you know, focuses on two things. The first is your ability to, as I was saying, listen very quickly versus having to give leading questions. And the second is iterating. So you learn something, you try something out, and then you repeat the cycle till you reach a point where you think that it's working both for you and the end consumer that you're trying to reach at. So, you know, we, we built this product and then we launched it and then we, there were a number of interesting learnings that came out as part of the digital launch. The first was that, of course, savings was something that we wanted to do. But if you, if you provided people with an option of, you know, here's the funeral insurance and here's how you can save, oftentimes people were like, well, why is there a savings component now suddenly being spoken about within insurance? We flipped the script and we said, you know, you're providing this uh, funeral insurance. How about you also do savings? Because that would be valuable to your of a household. And here is how much savings you can do. And that giving them the ability to choose, but also incorporating the way that they wanted to be listened to and included, changed the way that we found registrations going up. But also in the long term, how consumers then speak to each other about the value of these products that are being provided to them. And we had very short, what I believe, like use case cycles, like quickly try something out, a new feature out, and then change it if it's not working. But at the end of the day, what really helped us is the fact that management trying and building to understand that sitting on this side of the table, there are many things that you may not be able to see. And also thinking about all emerging consumers as one big subset of millions of people is also not going to help you. So you have to break it down ask them the right questions and really listen to what they're saying, which can be incorporated and just keep iterating because once you've done it, you need to keep doing it year to year to year four. But that's what makes your insights more valuable for them and their ability to speak to you a lot more easier as well. Great. Thank you, Rajni. Crystal, you um, mentioned uh, the work of addressing the invisibility of native communities that OISTA uh, and its partners serve. Um, can you give us uh, an example of, of how you do that? How do you bring assets and capital to these communities that historically may not been served in an equitable manner or served at all? Yeah, that's something that OISTA really has been um, pinpointing in so far as our strategic operations the past couple of years. So I'm finding this conversation so interesting. So we're essentially at a flip scale of, of some of the conversations we're having in that our respective organizations are native financial institutions. And I hate to use acronyms, so just very quick. A CDFI is a community development financial institution. It's essentially a government um, funded program under treasury and they're non-regulated financial institutions serving marginalized markets. So that could be urban, inner city, could be rural, and our platform is Indian country. Um, so in looking at that, um, our inclusion is, is what we work in and live and breathe every day. We, we live and work in our communities. I also believe that looking at OISTA's premise of operating, um, and I love what Monica indicated, something so important, so many organizations really need to look at internally is Number one, how are you coming to the table and how are you working with the community? Because in so many instances, marginalized communities are used to funding agents, grants, investments, saying this is what I'm going to do to and for you with good intentions, but never with you. And then when we look at respective impacts or um, you know, how that trajectory of that relationship evolves, it's not necessarily in the best interest for both parties, although maybe it, it started out as such. So we always 
come to a point of realizing that when armed with appropriate resources, Native communities have the ingenuity to ensure the cultural, spiritual, economic well being of their communities. They just don't have the resources. So when we're looking at inclusion, OISTA has been very successful as an intermediary lender, but we can't be the end all be all. Um, we need to leverage our assets. We need to bring in more diversified um, investors, backs of capital. So what we really try to do in this measure is bring in investment agents, bring in um, new entrants to the field. And interesting, if you look at, at how we began our investment portfolio, our first investors were religious institutions. Um, we lovingly call it nun money, and it's the retirement funds of um, nuns throughout the whole United States. And then we have social investors coming in, and then we have foundations. The very, you know, last we're finding is conventional institutions, you know, the big banks coming in, how most of our CDFIs are able to capitalize themselves, but we have found within the past six years, the social investing realm is ripe for how do I enter into Native communities? What do your investment models look like? What are these um, you know, specific opportunities in which if somebody is more interested in Hawaii or Alaska or the Pueblos or Navajo Nation, we have the ability to um, facilitate those relationships, but very important. That's how we operate as well. Although we are a transactional organization, the success of our last 20 years as well as our, our Native CDFIs are building those deep-seated relationships with trust. So I can say I've had one default on my portfolio. That was $10,000, I made that loan, they paid back seven. We know before our clients, if they get in trouble. So I mean, really building um, that relationship. But what we've done specifically is we hold flagship events for native CDFIs in Indian country, um, national events throughout the year. We have three major conferences that we um, facilitate. So with this, I have been very poignant the past five years to bring in um, social investors, asset management companies. And what we've done and what we found, which I find so interesting is people are very, very engaged, but they're afraid to ask the wrong question or they're afraid to offend. And I've actually found that's a barrier to entrance into capital. So OISTA has created spaces and special investing circles fireside chats where we bring in these investors in closed door measures, for lack of a better word, within our overall conference, within our native communities and CDFIs. And we open up that space to ask the questions you're afraid to ask about sovereignty, about limited waivers of sovereignty. How do I invest if you can't have collateral on trust land? Like there's what appears to be intricate issues of barriers for entering into to native lands, but they're not, um, we, we've been able to supersede those for 10 to 20, you know, 30, 40 years. So what we really do in this measure is bring investors in in a very respectful manner, allow them um, really to, to understand Indian country on, on one uh, spectrum, be able to ask those difficult questions and after start really building these relationships with these tribal nations as OISTA acting as a conduit to really opening up that space. Thank you, Crystal. Um, perhaps a quick follow-up question. You, you talked about connecting newer social investors um, and, and invest um, in these communities. Um, and specifically when it comes to the, the actual transactions of the loans, right? And, and how, can you speak a little bit more to how the investment structures or terms might need to be adapted uh, in response to the operating environment and the needs of the people, speaking of bringing folks to the table, right? That's a great question. And there's two things that we do quite differently and some lenders may be aghast at. So whoo, get ready, hold on to your seats. Um, but we provide very, very low interest rates. Typically our loans going out measure about 2.8%. We don't make a great deal off of our portfolio, but that's okay. So we're able to provide much lower cost funding to our native CDFIs. That ends up dwindling down to our end user where we have rates going out below par at about six, 7%. That's somewhat unheard of, but that's really what's needed in our communities for our local end users to be able to access long-term capital for home ownership, for entrepreneurism. And the second thing that we do on, on our stance is all of our loans are unsecured and uncollateralized. 
because we realize a lot of these native financial institutions, they don't hold those intrinsic assets. Their assets are more intangible in this regard. So we're able to manage that risk and other measures um, with relationship, with reporting, with regular check-ins and being able to assess in this measure. So I think those two things are quite different. Um, we don't ever plan on, on raising within the next five years our interest rates um, really to look at our self-sustainability or what's my spread. That's never our driving force. Our driving force is to get capital out low cost and in measures and investment terms and covenants that really will set these organizations up for success. Great, thank you. And thank you to the audience um, who are submitting the questions. Um, we have one that, that came through that um, I, I'll invite either Roshni or Monica or both uh, to, to respond. Um, I'd like to go through all of them. Um, so I will uh, invite our speakers to, to be brief so that we can work through the questions. Um, the first one is um, both of you have talked about uh, kind of introducing um, ideas. Uh, in, in Monica's case, it is introducing conversation around what does diversity mean and, and inclusion that th these are new conversations probably to the portfolio companies. And likewise, Roshni, your example uh, with the company in Ghana, um, you know, how to talk to low-income customers um, and, and assess their needs. I'd like to, you know, get your thoughts, uh, you know, any barriers when you start, you know, what was it like the initial conversation when you approach your, your companies or the CEOs in having these conversations that they may not be used to having? Uh, Monica, you have the first to unmute. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, super uncomfortable. And I think that's where, again, back to the, I mentioned nonviolent communications and empathy and just being gentle. I mean, this, I mean, especially you have to remember, you know, I have, I've, I've, I'm a mom of boy girl twins. And so we've tried really hard to give them the same toys, you know, you know and, and really it's just fascinating to see, you know, um, nurture nature express itself. And just, I think this notion, I call it the, I've got this, like, like, especially in tech and venture in tech, I don't know how much this is other people's experience, but you are rewarded for um, the bold action, knowing the answer, decisiveness, you know, kind of confidence. I mean, that is rewarded very materially with money. So it's not just a stylistic difference. It is very much, there is a pecking order of who gets capital, who gets backing. And so to come and be vulnerable and be, and say, actually, it, it's just been, I would say nothing short of beautiful to watch, to see these very alpha males come onto the screen on the phone. And again, you're also on Zoom, right? So that's kind of awkward in the beginning to say, and so I'll just share one, I won't tell you who it is, but it's a Brazilian entrepreneur. So English wasn't his first language. And he opened up, me it was Kristen who runs our impact work and said, um, you know, Monica, Kristen, I apologize ahead of time if, you know, English isn't my first language, if I get the words wrong, but he said, it's not just the Portuguese English. He said, there's a lot of concepts that I've never knew before. And he actually drew a picture of this gingerbread man. And he said, like, he was trying to explain the difference between gender, gender identity, uh, gender sexual orientation um and he actually showed like the brain the heart and the biological organs to like show he to, and the words he would and this was just such an incredibly moving experience just to say this is a whole new territory from even that those were three different um if you're talking about inclusion those are three different identities if you will that you have to think about right that you know so again i'm not saying that you're gonna have a program for every type of identity and you have to start somewhere which is why we start with gender um, you know, or, you know, people identify themselves as women, you know, that that's where we start. And again, doesn't mean it's exhaustive, but just to um, have him in his own imperfect way, articulate that I might not be on top of everything in my organization, which is what I'm expected to do. I'm expected to know and have the answers and have a plan. And I am clueless here. I mean, he didn't use those words, but that's what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, you know, again, that's where it begins, right? To, to, to show that, to demonstrate that vulnerability that saying, hey, we don't have it all. It's not all wrapped up in a bow. It's not all perfect. Like we are also taught and we teach our entrepreneurs like, oh, you know, show, you know, you should be, your pitch has to be perfect. You know, you be better, you know, kind of with confidence because people are already freaked out about investing in emerging markets, investing in these new business models. Don't add to it any confusion or complexity, right? No one wants that. So I just think it's a, um, it's a, been a, you know, very powerful for me, and I think um, has helped us really understand where are some of the blocks. So uh, it, it is, a, a, I would say, a very important of the conversation, how you have it, being patient and correcting when they say things that might be offensive or maybe just um, uninformed. 
<laughs> Great, thank you. Roshni, uh, anything to, to add? Because it sounds similar in terms of being Absolutely. I mean, approaching the conversation very thoughtfully. Yes, yeah. very interesting example by Monica. And I think for us, it's just slightly different. It's actually about when you're talking about the end consumers, you're trying to work with the management and helping them understand it's not that you are not doing this at all. What we're asking you to do is change the biases and the preconceptions that you have about products that are required by people, how they require them, what they need in it. So often the conversation is, here's a new way of thinking and trying it out. We're very, very, we're very supportive of working with you. That's why we have, in fact, launched programs, one-year programs in which people can go through in understanding and training themselves in learn, learn, listening to the customers better. And the biggest sort of uh, hurdle that you find sometimes is how is this going to be different than how I've always created my products and always sold them. So it's a matter of time and getting their buy-in and trust to be able to say that, this could actually change the way that you have engaged and interacted with your communities. Just give it a chance, even if it's for half a year or a full year. And at the end of the full year is when you really start seeing people who were at the beginning of the journey asking, you know, it's really just a fancy way of talking about the marketing to understanding how different customer centricity and customer understanding could be for them. And they are the ones then then they start engaging in every matter and manner. So I think each each company takes its different journey, but I've often seen things about, you know, why should I do this? We've already done this in the past. We've launched many products. How could this be any different? It seems like something only impact investors want to do. And it's all about patience with them. There are no wrong questions and you just have to keep going with them. That is fine. Let's build, let's build this. Let's build this. Let's build this. Thank you, Roshni. Um, we have a question that I think um, any one of you can feel free to chime in. Um, Crystal, you talked about um, how Orisa considers low interest rate as part of the investment structure um, to support and ensure inclusion. Um, are there other strategies that uh, you have used or come across um, that will strengthen the inclusivity uh, of the investment structure? And this is in addition to offering products uh, specifically targeting uh, low-income uh, community, for example, uh, low-income consumers, for example. Yeah, for us specifically, and I'll keep it short, um, but we also have a very strong arm in education and capacity building, and those are always culturally relevant and honorable to our respective um, tribal communities that we work with. So on the back end, when we look at finance, we look at inclusion, we've got these lower rates, um, and something that hasn't been you know, greatly addressed. The capacity building and education we do um, on you know, the, the back end and then after loans as well with the institutions really have been intrinsic in the success of our models. So for instance, we have the widest used financial education curriculum used within Native Nations and it's the curriculum is driven in a cultural context. So, and that may differ obviously from when we're working with a, a group in Hawaii to where when we're working in, um, you know, with Navajo Nation or up with the, the um, you know, tribes of the, the, the East Coast. So looking at, at um, being able to respect um, and bring those values and mores into the whole process is incredibly important. And there was ways to do that tangible, um, but I, I, I would use that as, as our um, you know, success of, of the platform on how that intrinsically comes together. We essentially build our borrowers and capitalize you know, borrowers and communities. So it's a very long journey mm -hmm. and very worthwhile, right? Yeah, so. Anything to add uh, from Roshni or Monica before I move to the next question? This is about how to build in features um, of inclusivity in the investment structure. Monica? Um, I, well, I, I think one, it's, um, you know, I think it's making efforts like, for example, we try with our summer interns always to um, kind of reserve seats. So I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't use the words like affirmative action, but I do think 
having this, the importance of when we're looking for board directors to add that element to the mix. We have in our pipeline, we've added a column when we look at what makes a great entrepreneur, you know, we've added, you know, kind of the past experience, the competence, but we've added profile, you know, again, without saying we want, you know, X percentage of women or X percentage of people of color. But again, just to put the factor on the table, I think measuring mm -hmm. matters. I think remembering that having one person there becomes a magnet. And, you know, there, there's a, you know, if you think about, you know, how many, um, you know, who your own social circles are and, you know, how, what's what you're exposing your kids to, like it becomes a self-reinforcing um, point, right? So just again, making small efforts to bring different perspectives to the table through advisory relationships, through mm -hmm. short-term internships. Again, ultimately you want to get to full-time hires and having your team look diverse, but it's very hard to say. I mean, it's no surprise that there's not more women entrepreneurs, if not more women investors, like like not rocket science, right? I mean, it's just not going to change until that changes. And I think people just have to really make them say, we're going to do something about this um, and make a choice and be a leader versus the excuses. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll move. Um, Rashi, do you want to add anything to this? Okay. Um, sorry, go ahead. Okay, the um, so question um, is directed to Monica. Uh, and the question is, how does Kona engage with end users to collect uh, the data uh, and the perspectives on the needs they face? Uh, so I think this probably sp uh, speaks to the initiative um, that they used spoke to earlier. Uh, it's a great question, but actually, you no, know, it was a separate initiative, because that's a whole different problem. And it's a great question. Um, so we've actually just, uh, we have just um, uh, decided to uh, do a partnership with 60 Decibels. So you might know them, Sasha Dichter, who used to be the head of impact for Acumen, has created a great company about kind of doing lean data. So using mobile surveys to get information about the end client, because it's actually a big problem. So in many of our portfolio companies, one, sometimes it's regulated, sometimes the regulators won't allow you to disclose that because it can be used for what they claw in the US redlining. So sometimes it's anonymized data, so you can't get it um, in terms of getting to figure out, like engaging them in a way like you'd like to. Um, but there, so we wanna, you know, so, uh, so we are actually coming in, um, you know, I think a lot of what Crystal said about, you know, doing with versus doing to, I think that's a very important construct. Um, we are uh, uh, doing representative samples. We're gonna take three companies and begin to design, how do you do an engagement survey that's agile enough and you know cost effective enough to do it mm -hmm. through our whole portfolio so we're just in that journey now uh, but i would love you know and i thank you i saw someone uh, wrote something about the gender bread um i love that gender bread uh from brandon but if people have ideas on other ways to cost effectively measure right now we found it very expensive so the answer is we do it imperfectly and we're still starting um, but we, the other th answer I would give to that is that when we do an investment, we always have information rights. And typically that's, oh, we get to see your P&L, your profit and loss and your balance sheet. But we also add monthly KPIs as part of our, in, even in our term sheet. So we set dashboards that are mutually agreed and they will include some of these factors that we want to collect on an ongoing basis. Um, but it, it's expensive and difficult. So I will say we are still learning um, and hopefully we'll have more to say about this in about a year's time. Great. Um, and there's a question uh, that I think, Monica, you addressed in your previous response, which is, um, and this is for anyone uh, on, on the panel, um, how do you consider inclusion when selecting companies or evaluating uh, prospective entrepreneurs to ensure that capital is flowing where it historically hasn't? I think, Monica, you mentioned just adding some of the factors uh, in the screen um, and wanted to invite if uh, Roshni or Crystal would like to add anything to that. Uh, question. Yeah, absolutely. So I think for, for us along with, I mean, looking at everything, at the end of the day, you are partnering with a couple of people who are sitting in the management and they are the ones who are setting the culture. So I think the way that the culture is being set from the top really changes the way that inclusion is going to flow down all the way to the end customer level. As uh, Monica and Russell have been speaking about, you know, it's, it's, it's about looking at the bigger picture and you can't just try to fix it by only focusing on one side of it. So one of the key things that we do look at is looking at both the actions of the investors that we're going at in the portfolio companies and what have they done even before we came in. You may have tried something that didn't work out, but at least you tried. If you're not even trying to listen to the end consumer in any particular way, it's really hard to believe that. Um, you know, you're going to change. We really, so I think the ethos in between behind investing in the people is really important to us. Yeah, and a follow-up question to that, Roshni, which is, as you work with 
company CEOs and other leaders, what kind of resources and uh, capabilities are needed, right, in order to, to inject inclusion uh, into their businesses, uh, all the work that you do, right? So I think the resources which could be, uh, that's a challenging one because generally it's, it's often thought about resources, the money side of it, right? If you just create new programs, actually the kind of resources that you need is more success cases and that they can themselves believe and see and, and see that that could be their trajectory as well. So the more cases that we have of success from around the world, that's a huge resource repository. And the second resource that we really believe in is giving the ability of these investors or the CEOs and CEOs to speak with each other. What we've often seen is that giving them a platform to be behind either closed door or open doors doesn't matter, but to really ask the challenging questions and make themselves vulnerable on why they have or haven't been able to listen to their end consumers or be able to service the low income consumers often gives them a much better and targeted idea than any investor can provide in many, many ways. So I think building that ability for them to have shared experiences with other individuals who are trying to achieve that goal could be one of the biggest resource provisions that you could do as an investor, in my opinion. Thanks. And uh, this question I'd like to invite uh, all of you to weigh in, and, and that is, um, as we about to close this conversation, what is one actionable takeaway that you'd like the audience to walk away with? Uh, I would say mine would be for those, you know, investors that are really looking to make a change in marginalized communities, there is always going to be an entry point. It may be harder for you to find or research, but I would say that it's worth the efforts to do so. So in, in looking at how do I reach Mississippi Delta? How do I reach Appalachia? How do I reach, you know, Colonias, Indian country? And in looking at um, pillar institutions, you'll generally find those are very deeply in, embedded and wedded with the community um, in regards to representation, in regards to mission, in regards to product and services. So I would say really try to build those relationships and come to a point of understanding and also come to a point of realizing there are things that you don't know. So it's kind of what Monica was attesting to with, you know, this organizational ego that we have in, in westernized society, be willing to learn and be willing to be malleable. And you can see great impacts and, um, long-standing generational impacts. Because I think if we don't address inclusion um, and equity and diversity, this is where the whole world is turning anyway. We need to be on the front end of this and really working with institutions that um, are looking at this embedded within you know, their particular missions. I think that this is just a growing field that we'll all continue to learn from each other on. But it's, it's just a step of doing it you know, put your, put your foot in the water and just try. I think that's what most of our, our communities and our end users are hoping for because they are a good bet. The communities are a good bet. Great. Um, Monica and Roshni. My action item would be to set an intention and act on it. So whether it's holding, telling your team if you have responsibility at any hiring decision to hold open a position until you have, you know, legitimately, not just, oh, let me find a resume that's a person of color or a woman, but legitimately having candidates that are interviewed, that are considered, that you you make that, a, you know, just a requirement that we're at least going to ask and at least going to evaluate, even if you choose the, you know, the non-underrepresented person, um, you know, you know, or I'm going to have a conversation um, around, you know, at my board about when we next time we hire a board director, I, again, I'm, I'm talking as an investor here. So, um, you know, in terms of the audience or so whatever your stakeholder is that we're going to look at, you know, sort of does, can we bring diversity factors in there? Or I'm going to add, um, again, a column on my evaluation checklist as I evaluate the, the next place, the next project I do or the next uh, contractor I hire. Again, I, I think small, do not underestimate small steps. Like really do not, like I, I think, the idea of being like politically concerned about things that are far away or global versus acting right in front of you. You have choices every day. Who do you check up a conversation with? Who's sitting next to you? Who do you approach? You have choices every day to model a different world. So I would say set an intention and start today. Last words over to you, Rashmi. 
very interesting. I think mine was also very similar, which is starting somewhere, right? And starting somewhere and really trying to think about what innovation can you bring when you're trying to listen to the end consumer. And by this, what I mean is oftentimes we're quite daunted by the fact that, you know, how do you do interviews? Is it perfect? As I said, start with two, three people if that's all you need, but you need to have that intention to start with it. And the second is actually... There, there are many ways that you can listen to an end consumer or low income consumer. First is obviously speaking to them directly, but also looking at socioeconomic determinants of health and financial inclusion. So for example, one of the things that we found is in, in a lot of our markets, the, the number of times that any information on healthcare is actually posted on Twitter is very well correlated with how the healthcare system with the healthcare inclusion is happening over there. So it is about expanding your vision and thinking about how can you use different data sets, but to listen to the end consumer and not to put your own preconceived notion of here's what the data should be telling and here's what I think it should be saying. But before anything, just start small, start from there. And that itself will reap many, many benefits to you as an investor, but also to the portfolio company as they grow. Thank you. Um, Roshni, Crystal, and Monica, you have brought um, great examples and insights. And I think among the key takeaways for me is um, in order to um, really work towards an inclusive economic growth, uh, build more diverse and inclusive economies, uh, we need to use our head to think critically, but we also need to not lose that of our heart to be humble, to be vulnerable, to lean in, set intention, and bring everyone to the table. Um, so um, thank you for sharing those insights. Um, I hope that uh, all of you joining us today um, will you know, leave this, converse, this conversation, will leave you with inspiration and tangible ideas on how to take this vision on working for systemic change so that capitalism can work for all. Um, and you have, that you can take some ideas uh, when you sign off today's program. So thank you once again to Monica, Crystal, and Roshni. Uh, next up on the program is a fireside chat uh, with Carol Ann Hilton, who is an inspiring voice bringing fresh new look on modern indigenous communities and possibilities for the future. I have heard her speak. She is fantastic. And uh, I hope that you can uh, join us. Um, so now I'd like to invite you to return to the main webinar room. To do that, uh, you will need to access the unique link that is in your registration confirmation email that will take you back to the main session. Um, so thank you very much once again, uh, and I hope that you can join us uh, in other future uh, Next Normal Now virtual series, the next one in the summer. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Giselle. Thanks, Giselle. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.